Forbes Books presents the Startup Science Podcast with Gregory Shepard, brought to you by StartupScience.io. Greg is an entrepreneur who has built and sold 12 businesses. He's a recipient of four private equity awards and is a featured 10x speaker and Forbes author. Here's Gregory Shepard. I'm back with Park Howell, the author of Brand Bewitchery. We've been talking about how his business of story has helped big businesses clarify their brand narrative and connect authentically to their audience. We also broke down the power of Park's simple ABT story framework. And but, therefore. Now Park, let's get into failure. How do you deal with a scenario where you make a big mistake and you need to use the ABT framework to make up for that mistake. You come clean on the mistake, right? I love this and I was going for this, but then I blew it by doing this and this is, was the outcome of it. Therefore, here's how I'm gonna rectify the situation and move forward. There, there's your setup problem resolution dynamic again, right? <laughs> is there a variation though between like if you're talking to a customer or an investor or a mentor or an advisor, you know, or a partner or a, a vendor, like, are, are there variations to this or are you using the same structure regardless of who you're talking to, at least in the beginning of the conversation? Gosh, you know, I use no variation for the framework of itself. Now the content's going to vary depending on who it is, of course, uh, but that setup, I really always like to start with the statement of agreement. So say I blew it with you, Greg, you know, um, Greg, I was so excited to be on your podcast, and it was great that we've got this set up, but I completely blew the time zone and missed our appointed time. Therefore, I'm hoping you you know your heart will be open and we can still have a chance moving forward on this. So I always like to start with a positive aspiration up top to get him nodding. Yes, we agree. Then insert the problem. Now you can do it backwards. You can start with the problem up top, but that statement of contradiction needs to contradict the problem, and but then introduces your solution, therefore is the way forward. We have found that that is not nearly as effective for one major overriding reason. When we start with the problem or what we perceive to be the problem for our audience, sometimes we miss the mark. And they'll say, Park, who the hell do you think you are? That's not the problem I see at all. Or we're the outside consultant looking in and we know what their problem is because we have the benefit of clarity from the outside looking in, but they haven't bought into the fact of our problem. They think their problem is still over here. So what we do when we lead with a problem is we can often set up a divisive relationship that now I've got to prove my point that this is what your problem is and nobody likes to be in that situation. So instead, we always like to start with aspiration, a shared vision. You know, is can we agree that this is what we all want? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're dead on. But we don't have it because of this problem. You're correct. Even if they start thinking, you know, we're off on the problem, at least we have that shared statement of agreement or mindset going in. Then we can work through the problem. If you do this really well, you will win them over to the way you see the problem versus the way they think the problem is. So set up problem resolution agreement. Yes, that's right. Con you know, conflict, uh-oh, oh shit, here's our problem, therefore, resolution. Here's the way forward. You could use it for crisis management, you could use it for reputation, you could use it to educate. Like, one of the things is, a lot of founders that are starting new businesses are disrupting something, which means that they have to, in some cases, explain that there is a problem in the first place, that people don't even know there's a problem, right? So they have to start out by educating the customer so that they're aware of something so that they're interested in buying mm -hmm. something. In that scenario, would you apply ABT the same way or would you take a, vari a variable? Because it, it sounds like it's just an algorithm that you could use. It's beautiful because it's so simple. You could use it for anything all yeah. the time. Right? Yeah. Well, think about it this way. Say, Greg, do you play an instrument? No, I, I, uh, I play the computer. The computer <laughs> is my instrument. All right. You call me up one day, you see my piano back here, and you say, Park, I want to learn how to become a jazz musician. Awesome. I need you to first learn the one, four, five chord structure, the end, but therefore. Is that interesting? You see this, this tripe paired structure to story everywhere. 
I want you to play Mary Had a Little Lamb. I want you to play all these things, one, four, five, one, and get that down. When you get that down, you go out and you start playing for people. And they go, wow, check that out. I never knew Greg could play the piano. That sounds really awesome. Now you start leveling up and you go, Mark, I want to I wanna have some more fun with this. All right, you've got the structure down of the ABT or the one, four, five, one. Now it's your job to start improvising. But only until you really nail that ABT or that 1451 um, structure. So once you get good at this, and to get good at it takes, gosh, I've been doing it a long time and I'm still learning how to do it in lots of different ways. If you apply it to your work for four to six weeks, and I'm talking about emails, you've got to write emails anyways. Write three emails a day starting with an and but therefore. It's going to re- require you to burn a few calories up front. Spend some energy to really get focused on your audience and your message, but you're going to find, number one, that it's a fabulous place to practice learning ABTs to build that narrative intuition. Number two, your emails will get responded to a lot faster because you were so crystal clear you were not making that homo sapien storytelling monkey on the other end of that email trying to decipher what the hell you're saying. And number three, it has a built-in call to action to it. So the thinking here, again, is going back to your initial uh, question, get the structure down first and then feel free to improvise on it once you start getting more comfortable with it. And by the way, it's fabulous for A-B testing. So say you've got a LinkedIn campaign out there, go ahead and write your typical LinkedIn post and then rewrite it as an and but therefore. Run them side by side for a month And I guarantee you, you will see four to 600% increase, four times to six times increase in engagement simply because you put it in this narrative framework. That is just so beautiful. It's like um, I took my uh, daughter to self-defense and it, you know, there's a lot of moves in self-defense, right? And the instructor was like, listen, I'm going to teach you three punches, three blocks and three kicks. And once you master those, you can put them in different combinations. And it's like, it's the same kind of thing, right? You, you master those and then you learn how to do variations of those things when appropriate. So people need to master the ABT, right? And then from there, start doing their own versions of the ABT. I totally get it. Let me digress for a second and ask you a different question, uh, which is, I'm really interested in the answer here. Who do you think is a master at ABT in the, in the, like, if you look at the Elon Musk and the Steve Jobs and all the guys that are out there, the Bezos and the Larry Ellison and Mark Benioff and all these, you know, classic CEOs, who, who would you say, or leaders, I should say, or thought leaders, whatever, who would you say is got this down? Richard Branson. Yeah. Who does it naturally? Um, Steve Jobs did it absolutely naturally. In fact, there's a video out there on YouTube of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs sitting at some conference and they were asked the question about where, why did Apple go to Microsoft for their floating point something or other? And they first went to Gates and Gates just bumbled through this thing and just, when you see Jobs in the background, he gets more and more frustrated as J- as Gates is trying to explain this and Jobs go, now, let, let me tell the story. And he literally took all that logical mumbo jumbo and told the story of Wozniak, who wrote this great uh, code, but it was just, it wasn't floating point. And he kept asking him to do it, but he wanted to do it. Everybody was asking for it, and therefore they went to Microsoft to be able to use that. When he tells that, you can watch this video online, uh, it's the whole piece is about 90 seconds long, but you see a marvelous example of the left brain, non narrative, communicator trying to connect with an audience and all he ends up doing is confusing them to the right brain storyteller. And as you hear Gates or uh, Jobs tell that story, you will hear there are two embedded ABTs in it and it's that perfect five primal elements of a short story. Now, Jobs is just doing this intuitively because he didn't know anything about the ABT or these elements of storytelling. He was just a gifted, intuitive storyteller. And Greg, my argument is all of us as homo sapiens are intuitive storytellers. It's what separates us from all other beings in the world. We think, plan, organize, and act in story. 
what I want people to do is become intentional about it by using this simple and but therefore framework or algorithm that they can use to make their messages land right the first time, every time. So a couple things here. So I really want to give you an opportunity to talk about your books. And I, I want to tell everybody that I was so convinced uh, after talking with Park that we actually are integrating this into the Visionaries platform by Gregory Shepard, which is the platform that all the founders can learn from and stuff we talk about. It's actually being integrated in there. That's how good this is. But he's also got a couple of books. Maybe you could talk about a couple of the books that you have and you have your own podcast yeah. <laughs> and maybe use this opportunity to plug some stuff. I'm all well, for number that. Number one, Gregory, I am so delighted to be a part of your program. I'm a huge believer, of course, in the startup world. I mean, that's where all of our vision and new uh, techniques and technologies come from. So thank you for allowing me to be able to teach this to your attendees. Um, yeah, I've got a couple books out. My first book I wrote is called Brand Bewitchery. And it uses my 10-step story cycle system that I got from Hollywood, from Joseph Campbell and the Hero's Journey was in, that, that inspired I love it. Joseph Campbell stuff. It's so cool. Yeah. yeah. And, and I saw that. You know, the, how this all came about real quick is I was running my ad agency out here in Phoenix, Arizona. And as the internet hit and social media started blowing up, I realized that the way we used to brand and market community communicate companies no longer work. And I was fortunate because our middle child, our son Parker, was going to film school at Chapman University, a very prestigious film school from 2006, 2010, graduated. Now he's out in Austin, Texas, working with virtual reality. I said, Parker, send me your books and your recorded lectures when you're done with them, since I'm paying for them, because I want to know what does <laughs> Hollywood know about story and story structure to be able to compete in you know the most competitive storytelling market in the world, LA. That's when I first learned about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. And Greg, it hit me right upside the head. I'm like, oh my God, this here's a map to storytelling and communication. How come this has never been taught in any communication course or advertising program that I've been a part of? That's when I boiled it down and we started using it for brand development, brand narrative strategy development. Yeah, you simplified it a lot because, you know, the hero's journey is kind of, it's a way oh, more, yeah. it takes some time to get it down, but you've got it to the point that it can be digested. Well, and, and the used. hero's journey is a one and done circle, right? You got a hero in their ordinary yeah. world. They have a call to adventure. They go to this extraordinary world. They get put through trials and tribulations. They learn something about themselves. They get leveled up. They return back home. Well, I took that and said, you know what? This is actually in business really a narrative spiral. It expands with the telling of your story to expand engagement. So it's not a one and done thing at all. The idea is to invite people yeah. into your story, get them as re you know repeat customers, and more importantly, maybe, is to get them sharing your story with their world because there's no more powerful form of advertising than free word of mouth marketing, right? We can all agree to that. So I was teaching that and worked with a lot of brands on it. And then I found the end, but therefore about 10 years ago through my good friend, Dr. Randy Olson, Harvard evolutionary PhD uh, uh, scientist turned USC film school graduate. He's written several books on using narrative in the science world to be able to communicate their big complex ideas, simplify them, clarify them so the rest of the world can learn. And when I found the ABT in his second book, again, written for the science community, I'm going, oh my God, Greg, this is like the holy grail for branding and marketing. Talk about being able to take a complex pitch message and simplifying it from our audience's point of view, giving you that narrative framework that that limbic buying brain loves. And I'm like, is this thing too good to be true? And so I started researching it. Um, you know, think about nursery rhymes. Almost every memorable nursery rhyme is an and but therefore. When I say nursery rhyme, do you have one that pops to mind? Yeah. I mean, I like Dr. Seuss stuff. <laughs> yeah. But I was just, when you were talking just now, I was just thinking about like, there's something immensely valuable. I mean, first let's talk about your genius, right? You have taken and studied all these different ways to tell a story and then you have digested these and compressed them into a, and distilled it down to a very simple way of teaching that. And then you've created a, a, a way to go about this in a book. And 
outside of a book. It's genius to begin well, with. So anybody that gets involved here, it's not like you're just getting, you know, this Park, Park Howell's approach to this, right? You're getting everybody's approach to this distilled down for you. There's That's pretty pretty amazing, man. That's freaking pretty awesome. I just, I, I just have to say that. I'm just like, this is, it's, it, it's one thing, you know, like when I wrote the book on the startup life cycle, I studied startups for 30 years and read all these books and, and, you know, learned all these different operating systems, all this stuff to do it. And then people get, get all of that experience distilled down. It's the same thing with you. It is a, it takes a special genius to, to understand the opportunity. Like you were talking about that you read it and you were like, oh, this is perfect brand. Not everybody could do that. Right. So you, as a listener, you're getting to take advantage of his genius and all of the study that he, all, all the studies that he did and the people that came up with those. Uh, it's pretty special. Well, thank you, Greg. You've got Steve Jobs right over your shoulder there. So he's obviously a, a hero in your life. We're right along Einstein there. Would you say that Jobs was an inventor or an integrator? He's definitely an inventor. I mean, he's a visionary, yeah. right? He wouldn't be without him. You know, I have a lot of arguments with because i i used to be a coder right so you you know you have coders that go well he didn't write any code and i was like code is worthless until somebody can tell a story <laughs> about it and get it sold right they're both necessary so on one side you have einstein who was the integrator and on the other side you have uh steve jobs who is the visioning you look at steve jobs as much more um in terms of his ability to create and maintain and monetize business as compared to einstein which everybody else did it on his behalf, you know? <laughs> or I think about Jobs, and a lot of times people make the argument that he was more of an integrator. He did invent, like, the iPhone, but he didn't invent a lot of the different parts of that iPhone. He saw them in the world and said, if we take some of this, integrate it with some of this, and integrate it with some of this, voila, we have invented a brand new product. It's kind of where I was going with that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If you look at it from um, the the writer who wrote that book, um, Rocket yeah. Fuel, then you see it. Then you see it that way. Yeah. Sorry, I was. That's using where it I was going compared to visionary versus because execute. I haven't yeah. invented anything here. The and but therefore has been around since the beginning of time. The hero's journey. I mean, in the very first recorded book of Gilgamesh follows the hero's journey precisely. Um, it's just this this archetype. You know, it's a structured a narrative that we've always seen and used around us because people argue we can embrace the hero's journey because it's simply a reflection of how we experience life. So when we see it in, in movies, it's just inherent in how a story is structured. I just simply integrated that into the business world. Now, the hero's journey is way too woo-woo for lots and lots of B2B business minds. And I say to them, you know, B2B doesn't necessarily mean business to business. It quite often means boring to board. Why would you bore <laughs> your audience? You know, when you have this marvelous business offering, use these templates that we've seen in the world since the beginning of time. And we'll go back to real quick on like the nursery rhyme thing. Here's one. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider who sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. Perfect and but therefore. And people would argue, well, Park, there's and but and therefore don't even exist in that. And I say, yes, but they're all implied in the framework. For instance, little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet and she was eating her curds and whey. That's our setup. That's act one. That's agreement. Now, here's the complication. But along came a spider who sat down beside her, which triggers our limbic problem solving brain. Begs the question, what the hell happened next? Leads to our statement of consequence. Therefore, frighten little Miss Muffet away. You know, I mean, you see it everywhere in the triparet structure to story. So why don't we use it in founders' pitches in explaining our complex ideas and making them very simple from the point of view from our audience and underscoring the outcome? What is the benefit of without overriding or overdoing what we're making in the widgets that are so near and dear and special to our hearts. Nobody cares. They just want to know, what do those widgets lead to? What is that out? Yeah, you're right. I always tell founders, uh, you know, they oftentimes forget, you know, there's the ICT, ICP, the ideal customer profile, which is the business. And then there's the persona, which is the person. 
And a lot of times when they do marketing, they focus on the business and they forget that they're having to convince a person. The person isn't always in favor of what the business is in favor of, especially if it's going to cost them their job or create stress or make them go to their CFO and ask for more money or whatever, those sort of things, right? It becomes, so this is a way to talk to the person and then turn that person into your champion. And then they're willing to march, uh, march through the battle with you uh, in order to get the thing to the, the people that need to make it happen for the company. Greg, are you familiar with Christopher Lockhead? He is a brilliant, brilliant branding mind, category design mind up at Silicon Valley. Yeah, I went to a, he was a keynote at a lecture I went to, yeah. Yeah, and he, he wrote with his partners one of my favorite all-time branding books, especially for the tech sector, called Play Bigger. And he had me on his podcast about a year ago. And I introduced to him, and he's all about POV, that point of view of where your brand and how you can design a category, become the category king by being the first to market with it and really owning it. And I showed him, told him about the ABT. Then the very next day, he puts it in a text. He uses the ABT for text, sends it out to the world, takes a screenshot of it and sends it to me. And he goes, I don't know what the hell this is or how it works, but here's the first thing that has happened to me using the ABT. Let me quickly just read the tweet for you. It says, most entrepreneurs would love to design a new category and build a billion dollar business. There's his statement of agreement. But there is so much startup bullshit on Twitter, it's hard to know who to listen to. Therefore, meet David Sachs. He knows a few things. And then there's a link to his show interviewing David Sachs. So perfect ABT, but here's the thing. In under six hours, Christopher Lockhead got over 60,000, almost 70,000 engagements on that one tweet. And now this is a very prolific social media contributor out there. And he goes, Park, I have never seen anything like this before. And now he uses it to set up his podcast interviews, his Substack articles, he uses the ABT throughout. There's a good example of the power of it in your world from a guy who's made a very nice career out of creating POVs or category designs and how the ABT does this, as he says, fantastic double click on their approach to category design. So if we were to give then the audience some resources, first of all, how do they get in touch with you? What books should they buy? Is there, you know, what blogs, like what are the all the resources that they need to learn ABT? I'm sure anybody that's listening right now is just sitting there going, holy shit, how do I get a hold of this thing? So I've got Business of Story podcasts. I've been doing it for eight years. Um, I have been rolling out a, a special series on brand bewitchery. Instead of me just sitting down and trying to read this book and putting out the audio book all in one fell swoop, what I did is I decided to chunk it and every episode, starting with episode number 420, I read you one chapter and give you a bunch of examples. So you can sit down and listen to Brand Bewitchery on your drive home. I've got time halfway through the book. So that's one place to go. On my podcast as well, episode number 400 is I take the listener through my 10-year journey with the ABT, have Dr. Randy Olson on who first introduced me to it, and a number of other people that have used it. And it's a way to understand all of the different applications of the ABT. That's a great place to go. Um, third thing I'd say is I've got this book that I co-authored, and I mean it's a little one with Dr. Randy Olson, and it's a quick little hand guide, if you will, as you are sitting down to write ABTs. It's called the Narrative Gym for Business. And as you start applying the ABT, this will give you a lot more case studies and examples and take you on a much deeper dive than we could do today on how to use the ABT, ABT 201, ABT 301. Um, and then, of course, your course. Uh, we'll be teaching the ABT, the five primal elements of a short story for big impact, and the 10 step story pro um, cycle system that you can use for presentations, pitches, and long form communications right with your um, startup science course. Right on. So we'll put some of that stuff into the show notes. Um, and man, I got to tell you, I, I just had a great time talking to you at the show and listening to you. And this was, was really fantastic. And I think it's a real honor. It, like I said, it's, you're so humble and it's real easy to, to forget about how much talent it takes to recognize 
an opportunity and then execute on it. And then, exp- I mean, it's easy to make something simple, complicated. It's really hard to make something complicated, simple. And you've mastered that. And I'm, you know, just gratitude, Park. It's a it's a, a real benefit for everybody to have you around. And I appreciate your time. Well, Greg, thank you so much for being here. Or for me being with you. I'm so used to hosting my own show. I'm thanking you for being on my show, <laughs> which you were on a few weeks ago, a, few, a month or so ago. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited to be able to talk to you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Ben. You too. And that's it for another episode of the Startup Science Podcast. Founders, as a thank you for leading the changes in our world, I'm offering free access to my Startup Science platform, Visionaries by Gregory Shepard, a one-stop shop for founders. It has everything from a startup academy to investor match, grant finder, pitch finder, virtually everything in the startup ecosystem there for you. Go to gregoryshepherd.com, click on Visionaries to get access and use the code FOUNDERS, all capitals, for free access to the platform. Check it out for yourself. And if you enjoyed the show, we would love it if you could subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'll see you next time. Namaste, my friends. The Startup Science Podcast with Gregory Shepherd is brought to you by StartupScience.io. Founders can log on to StartupScience.io and use code FORBES to get free access. To connect and find out more about Greg, go to GregorySheppard.com. The Startup Science Podcast is a production of Forbes Books.